Today we're going to be taking a look at managing credit. Um, whether it's no credit, bad credit, good credit, we're just going to take a look at some of the things. And I'm going to throw this little quick disclaimer out there. When it comes to talking about credit, I know there's a lot of people that think that they've got a pretty good handle on it or no, but like I tell my classes every day, please keep in mind that where you may have some knowledge, there might be some other people that don't. And I think it's just really good that we all get a new refresher anyway too. So that's kind of what the, today is about. So I'm going to start with a question of the day. Um, our question of the day is what is the average FICO score for Americans? We know it plays a big role in our daily life, can determine the interest rate a consumer is going to pay for credit cards, loans, mortgages, or whether they will get a loan at all. Average credit scores most recently bottomed at about 686 during the housing crisis. Um, there was a sharp increase in foreclosures. Um, they have since steadily ticked higher. And does anybody have a guess of what the average is today? You say 712. 712? That's a good guess. Yeah, I'm gonna go lower and say around seven, you know, 690. Okay, all right. Well, the average score today is 704. <laughs> it was 700 for a while, and now it's just, it's bumped up just a little bit. And so again, the credit, your credit score is gonna range from 300 to 850. And so 704 is a, is a very decent credit score. And a couple things, one question I always like to ask you know, for, for people is do you know what your FICO score is? And if you do know, how does that compare to the national average? Um, and if no, we'll kind of talk about some of the ways that we can find that out as well. Do you think average score of 704 represents good or bad credit? Slightly better than average. Okay. Agree to that? Okay. Um, and what advice would you give to someone who has a FICO score of 650 wants to increase it? Uh, I guess the thing that, <clears throat> well, growing up my mom just said, have you credit? Yeah. I'd no. say try and pay down your debts as, as quickly as you can. Okay. Debt to credit ratio. All right. Deal. Great. And again, we're going to talk about the breakdown of, of some of that as we go through here too. I've also included this, and when you get the... Um, the presentation, you can actually go online and you can look at a FICO credit score estimator. Um, I, I'll click on that real quick. We'll just take a real quick look at it. And it just asks some very, some very general questions. How many credit cards do you have? And we'll just, we'll just kind of play around with it real quick here. Let's just say we have two to four credit cards, but let's say that we've had it for 10 to 15 years. How long ago did you get your first loan? Let's say that's in that same 10 to 15 year range. How many credit cards have we applied for? Let's say we haven't applied for any. We're happy with what we have. When was the last time you opened a new loan or credit card? Let's say that was more than six months ago. Currently have a balance. Let's say we're doing pretty well. Total balance on all of your loans. Let's say that we're a little bit on the high side here. So let's go, we'll actually take it all the way down here to 20,000 plus. Let's say that we've always been on time though, and we have nothing past due. Let's say that our balance is at about 20 to 29%, never experienced a bankruptcy. And this will give us a, a quick average, so that would be pretty good. So you can play around with it a little bit. This is something that I love using in my classrooms too, just for, for kids. And kids don't necessarily have their first credit card yet, but just let them play around just to see what it means to, to have and keep and maintain credit. So, probably should define credit. Um, credit is borrowed money that you can use to purchase goods or services when you need them. You get credit from a credit grantor whom you agree to pay back uh, the amount that you've spent plus any applicable finance charges and agreed upon time. Basic definition for you. And then, of course, the question credit is it good or bad? I know I introduced a little bit of Dave Ramsey to you guys um, at the last session. And if Dave Ramsey is standing in front of you, he is telling you don't worry about it, credit is uh, you know, can be a bad thing, get you in a lot of trouble. One of the things that I push with my students, um, and my students come in with really a mixed bag of feelings about it because they've heard stories from their parents. And so when I ask the question, is, is credit good or bad? It's, it's pretty funny how many of them will say, oh, I'm just gonna stay away from it, I'm gonna stay away from it. But I try to push this point with them. Credit isn't evil at all, it's amoral. It's not good, it's not bad. It's how you use it. So when you, when you consider from that perspective, it has nothing to do with credit itself. Credit is just simply a tool. It's there for us to use, it's there for us to have. 
Um, and it, how we use it is what's going to make it good or it's going to make it bad in our lives. These are the types that you're going to run into. Um, revolving credit, which includes credit cards. Revolving just simply means you've got a, a balance or a, you've got a, a line of credit that they give you. You can use up to a certain amount. You can use a little bit of it. You don't have to use it at all. Installment credit would be our car loans and things like that. Service contracts would be our cell phone bills, um, utilities, those types of things. And then our charge cards and accounts. Those are the ones that we just simply put on an account for, um, for a month at a time. And usually we're supposed to be paying those off in full each month. So those are some of the different types that we're going to run into. Now, this next survey, um, our survey I'm going to give you, it's how will you handle credit? And did you both pick up a copy of that? So if you want to just take a look at that real quick, um, it just says the way you use money can give you clues about how you might use credit. Take this quick quiz to test your own credit ready skills. So the first question asks, it says your aunt gives you $50 for your birthday. Would you put it in your savings account? Would you buy yourself something you need? Would you consider it extra spending money? Or would you treat yourself to a night out? So just circle it. And again, I always like to say when you're answering these, try to answer it the way that you really would do it, not the way you think you should do it. All right? Number two, if you got a new job that pays $85 a week, would you A, open a savings account immediately? Would you wait until your first paycheck, then decide what to do? Would you make a plan to pay off your bills? Or would you start shopping for a new iPhone? Number three, when you owe somebody money, do you feel A, uncomfortable until it's all paid off? B, aware of the debt, but not uncomfortable about it? C, interested in paying it off as soon as it was convenient? Or D, willing to pay, but not in a hurry? Number four, your best friend asked to borrow $50 from you. Would you A, lend it, but only in case of an emergency? B, be happy to lend it? C, be willing to lend it, but want to know when you'd get it back, or be, would be paid back? Or D, not be willing to lend it. Number five, when you buy something, do you A, have to be sure of all the details beforehand? B, ask some questions, but not too many. C, listen to what the salesperson tells you. Or D, assume everything will be okay. Number six, if a bill is due on the first of the month, would you make, a, make the payment A, at least 10 days in advance, B, around five days in advance, C, on the due date, or D, when you had the money? Number seven, how often do you buy on impulse? A, never, B, very rarely, C, sometimes, or D, almost always. Number eight, if you had a credit card, owed $100 and had the cash to pay, would you A, pay the bill in full, B, pay $50 and keep the rest for spending, C, pay $25 and put the rest in savings, or D, pay the minimum of $10 and use the rest for other bills? Number nine, if you had a credit card and were shopping for something, would you A, consider the price, cost of credit, and the quality of the item? B, just shop for the best price? C, buy the best quality regardless of price? D, buy what you want even if it's expensive? And then the last question. If you have $20 in your pocket, do you A, hang on to it no matter what? B, spend it but only if you must? C, spend it but on something you really want? or D, spend it on just about anything, all right? So as you get to the bottom here, each A that you circle is gonna give you five points, each B is three, each C is two, and each D is one. So go ahead and figure out your score. Now, of course, no survey is perfect, but I like this one. So if you had one to 18 points, it says that you're a big spender. Uh, you love to buy, you're not very savvy about getting the best value, so handling credit could be a crisis, and you should be very cautious about that. Um, if you scored 19 to 29, you're a casual consumer. Uh, it says you're too relaxed about price and credit terms for your own good. There could be trouble ahead. This is where a lot of my students fall in, is that casual consumer. Uh, 30 to 44 points, you're a smart shopper. You're clever about money, but you could be a little bit more sensitive about credit costs. And if you finished 45 to 50, then you're a financial wizard. You really shouldn't have any problems at all. No, I'll leave this to you. You don't have to share with me where you fell. But uh, again, I just, I like that. I think it's a, a kind of a good way to introduce people to credit and what it's all about. Now, when it comes to credit, like I said, with it being amoral, we need, again, to look at some of the advantages and disadvantages of it. Some, some big advantages that people, I think, really can take 
take um, some kind of comfort in. Credit can be very convenient. Uh, we know that. If um, it's, it's Christmas time, we know we've got um, a bonus coming to us at the end of the year. We've got Christmas shopping to do. It, it gives us, it allows us to, to make those purchases and things that we, that we need to for, for Christmas time, those types of things. It does give us immediate purchasing power. It does allow us to not have to worry about carrying cash with us. And it also gives us the ability to consolidate bills if for some reason bills get a little bit crazy on us. So credit can have some advantages. But of course there's the disadvantage that go along with it too. It's a loan. It's, it's money that we have to pay back. We know the interest rates that we pay may go up or down. Um, there may be some additional fees that go along with it. And of course, the last two I think are the ones that get people in trouble the most. It can be very easy to overspend and it can promote impulse buying because we know that people are based a lot of things on their emotions and what makes them feel good and credit allows them to kind of satisfy that. And I always think that this is a really <laughs> important statement too to make. There's actually scientific studies out there that show when you pay for something with a credit card, you have no feelings whatsoever. It does nothing to you, absolutely nothing. But they have shown if you've got a $100 bill and you give somebody that $100 for something that costs 50 and they give you 50 back, you immediately feel it. And so that's, I, th I think, something that's really important to remember when it comes to, to credit. When we talk about credit too, we wanna make sure that we talk about good credit and why it's so important. It's gonna have an impact on a lot of different areas in your everyday life. Um, from getting a car loan to getting a mortgage, um, even to getting that job and getting an apartment, all those kind of things. I think my students are most thrown off by the fact that your credit has an impact on your car insurance. They love that idea that if my credit is good, my car insurance is gonna be cheaper. They're a little intimidated by the fact that it might mean that it could be a determining factor as to whether or not they get a job. But those things are all the reality of what credit is. So when we take a look at credit scores, how we keep track of what our credit is, we have to look at the three credit reporting agencies that are out there. Now there's, of course, there's more than this. Um, there's the credit karmas out there, there's those kind of things. But we know when it comes to most lenders, most creditors, these are the three that they're gonna use. We have Experian, we have TransUnion, and we have Equifax. Those are the three main ones. I put the numbers up there um, in case you'd ever want to contact them. The um, website at the bottom, are you familiar with annualcreditreport.com? Okay, because that really, again, this is one of those things where you are entitled to one free credit report from each one of these bureaus a year. And for my students, one of the things that I'll have them do is we'll, in class, we'll sit down with their Chromebooks and I'll have them do a Google search on themselves, or do a annual credit report search on themselves. And most of them say, there's nothing here. <laughs> and I tell them, that's good. You don't want anything there because you're 17 years old, you're 16 years old. If you've got something on there, it means somebody's been using it. Now I have to admit, there have been a couple of students that have actually had credit reports that have shown up. And in discussions, it was mom, it was dad. And so that led to a whole different, different situation, whole different problem that you know, we had to deal with, but it's, it's great to be able to do that. So my, my, re, or my recommendation is always this. If you haven't searched for your credit for a while, I think if you're gonna look for a car loan, if you're gonna look for a credit card, if you're gonna look for anything, jump out there and take a look at, if you haven't done it for a while, go ahead and take a look at all three of them and see what it has to say. Um, but after you've done that for that first time, then the next year, follow it up and say, okay, on January, I'm gonna look at my Experian credit report. I'm gonna get a copy sent to me. Um, in June, I'm gonna get TransUnion. And in October or November before Christmas, I'm gonna take a look at Equifax and see where I'm at. And I just think that's a great habit to get into. Now, the one thing that kind of throws people off with this though, is that when you get your credit report, it's just the report you get. You don't get the credit score. If you wanna get your credit score, you're gonna actually have to pay for that. So, any questions on those? Why is the credit reporting so obfuscated from the consumer? Well, I think part of it because there's the, the cost of the gathering, because again, that's all they do, they just gather this information. And so they've gotta make sure they figure out a way that they can 
make their you know make their money in order to do that. Um, so for businesses to get a copy of your credit score or your credit report, they're going to pay their fee, right. and I think that that's part of the reason why they do it. Now that's where places like Credit Karma or Discover Now is offering their own versions of your credit score. The biggest problem with that is that in most cases, Credit Karma, for example, I don't mean to slam on Credit Karma, but they've they've shown that your points are anywhere from 30 to 60 points higher with Credit Karma. And so when you go in for a loan, and if you're using Credit Karma, you're going in with all this confidence saying, oh, this is my credit score. And then they take a look at one of these three and they say, mm, no, it's not. And that's a little disheartening for people. It, when, and when you do get your FICO, and again, when the FICO score comes to you, usually it's gonna come to you if somebody has um, done a credit search on you, if you're applying for a loan, um, if you get denied credit, then they're going to give you that information as well. Um, but the score itself, um, the Fair Isaac and Company score is determined by these things. 35% is the payment history that you have. So when we talked about building credit scores at the very beginning and you said, you know, making sure things are paid on time, that, that really is, you know, statistically the most important thing. The amounts that you owe, they want to look again, that debt to credit ratio that you have to make sure it's not too high. 10% is based on any new credit that you're, that you're getting. 15% is on the length of credit history and then 10% is on the credit mix. And we'll talk a little bit more about those things in just a little bit. I've got a, a video here I'm gonna share with you about, about credit reports, but before I do that, because I am a fa fan of Dave Ramsey as well, I wanna put this out there too. If Dave Ramsey was standing next to me and I'm talking with you about credit scores and telling you the importance of it, he would just be laughing at me, saying, why are you worried about this? This shouldn't matter. This is just a scam. This is something that, that lenders out there want you to get involved, they want you to borrow, so you build this credit score. I think in a perfect world, in an ideal world, it would be great to not have to worry about this. You take care of your bills, you don't take out loans, you, you, know, you pay cash for everything. I think that that's, that's like the ultimate pinnacle to, re, to, to try to strive for. But is that reality? And when I talk to my students, that's what I tell them. I said, this is what you should strive for. You should strive that you don't have to worry about this, but the reality says you're gonna have to. So that's why we talk about it. But let's take a look at the, the video here and You know your credit report. That thing lenders look at when you apply for a loan is important, but what is it exactly? Let's focus on the three main U.S. credit bureaus. They collect credit information from your bank, credit unions, credit card issuers, retailers, mortgage lenders, collection agencies, and public court records. All of the information about you from all sources is compiled into a credit report, an electronic file based on your previous and current credit history. Lenders can then access these credit reports to get a better understanding of whether you are a qualified or risky candidate for credit. Credit reports are dynamic. They change when lenders update your information or when new public records about you are posted. These changes can impact your FICO scores. Now, let's look at exactly what the credit report contains. Start with your personal identity information, name, address, and social security number. This information doesn't impact your credit score. However, you can protect against potential identity theft by checking for accuracy. Your reports also contain public records the court collects on bankruptcy. If you've ever had an unpaid bill turned over to a collection agency, that will likely show up on your report too. Information called trade lines form the heart of the report. That's information about your various credit accounts, such as when they were opened, the loan amount, and your current balance and payment history. Creditors typically report this information on a monthly basis. Finally, whenever someone accesses your credit file, an inquiry is reported. There are many types of inquiries, but the FICO scores only consider inquiries resulting from a credit application. All of this information forms the foundation of your FICO scores, a measure of your credit risk used by 90% of the top lenders. Now, FICO isn't a credit bureau, but rather a company founded on scoring credit reports. Working closely with the credit bureaus, FICO creates scores based on the bureau's data, scores that make it easier for lenders to understand credit reports and determine your credit worthiness. And remember, you can and should review your own credit reports. Monitor them, check them for accuracy, and see what factors are impacting your FICO scores. Just a nice brief little breakdown. 
They kind of made mention in the video here that some of the different places that can look at your credit report. Lenders, of course, are the first ones, and and that's you know when I again when I talk about this, we talk about you know when you go through the line at Kohl's and you apply for for Kohl's credit or for a store credit card or anything like that, how quickly they can determine whether or not you qualify for it. So it, it allows them to do that. Landlords are another one that can take a look at it. Um, insurance companies, like I mentioned before, um, potential employers are gonna look at it too. And like I said, those last two, uh, you know, those kind of trip people up sometimes. They don't realize that those are, are the potential people that are gonna be looking at your, at your credit report. So again, again, Dave Ramsey, I love you, but <laughs> the reality out there is that we've gotta make sure that we take care of that. Here's some of the ways, again, just to, to work on establishing and, and making sure that you build up this score for yourself. You know, the, the whole idea, the concept of starting small and building up, I think really is important. Um, having a savings and checking account can help. Now, those might not directly impact your score per se, but especially in a community like ours and with, with the Bank of Prairie de Sac, what I tell students is that if you have a savings account, if you have a checking account, and you maintain those in really good, good status all the time if you need that first car loan, where you might go to Madison or you might go to somewhere else and ask for a loan, institutions there are gonna say, no, sorry, you don't qualify. But because the bank has a history with you, they might be more interested to do that. Um, putting utilities and rent in your name is gonna help out as well. That's another one that I give young people the recommendation if you're gonna go off to college, you're gonna live with some roommates, you wanna build your score, instead of worrying about getting that credit card right away, put your, your electric bill in your name, put your heat bill in your name, and then make sure that all your roommates are paying on time so those payments are made. Um, local department store, bank credit card, gas cards, those can help. Um, getting cosigners for a small personal loan can do that as well. The cosigner is there, of course, as just a safety net for the lender, but you are the one that's making the payments, you are the one that's gonna be impacted by that. Um, offer larger down payments for a loan, those types of things. And then the secured credit card. And this is another one too that I think is a really good option for people, either if they're just starting out in credit or maybe if they've had some credit problems and they want to build up. Um, you guys familiar with secured credit cards? Okay. So what you, what you would do is, let's say that um, you would have, let's say you got your tax refund and you got $500 for a tax refund. You could contact a company, a credit card company, you'd say I'd like a secured credit card. You send them the $500, they hold on to that and they issue you a credit card with $500 as the line of credit. You use it like a regular credit card, you use it for a year or two, and then once you've met their criteria, they're gonna send you that $500 back and they're gonna issue you an unsecured card. So it's their way of, of being safe, but again, for you, it's a way of building that credit in a safe way, knowing that you, you're not gonna max yourself out because they're gonna have that $500. So that's just another way to do it. And then as far as for maintaining good credit, um, some, I think, 10 really important things to think about. Just make sure you set that budget and you live within that budget, knowing what you can afford, knowing what you can't. You always wanna make sure that you're providing complete and accurate and consistent identification on your credit applications. You wanna make sure you're paying your bills on time. Um, again, having some credit, but not too much credit that's gonna overextend you. Having that mixture of credit types is really important too. If, if everything that you have is just credit cards and that's what you're counting on billing your credit with, that's not gonna be a good thing. So it's great to have your cell phone bill in your name. It's great to have um, a, a mortgage or a rent payment that you're making or a car loan that you're having as well. Uh, make sure you keep your card balances low. Make sure you use caution when closing accounts. And this one still is one that just, I think baffles people and it still baffles me. Um, I know people who are kind of in that rotation now of getting, doing card transfers, opening up a new card, transferring their old balances onto there to get to extend that 0% financing for another um, 12 months or 14 months or whatever it is. And then the question is, well, if I do transfer that, do I close out this old one? And it's kind of a catch-22. If you don't close it out, that's potential debt that you have, which is gonna hurt you. If you do close it out, you've lost that history. Um, so again, my recommendation, I guess, again, and I'm not, I'm not an expert in this, but I would just be very, very careful with what you're closing out. The ones that you've had for a while, even if you're not using them anymore, those are the ones that you can leave open. Um, the short-term ones, again, to, to close out that potential debt out there, 
um, might not be a bad idea. Um, be aware of the debt to income ratio that you have. Make sure that you can demonstrate stability with um, where you're living, um, with jobs, those kind of things. And then number 10, I think this is one people get, if, if they start to run into problems, they get so embarrassed by it. But really the most important thing is let's you know, reach out to those lenders and say, hey, I'm having some problems. What can we do here? How can we make this work? And they're going to they're gonna appreciate that and probably uh, help you out more than what you think. All right. So now we're going to move into a little bit with managing credit and taking a look at some of the topics that go along with this. Um, first, of, <clears throat> first of all, looking for a credit card. Um, I've just got a, a sample um, off to the side here of, of some things about a credit card offer that would be made to you and some things that you can take a look at. Um, things like the APR. Um, on this particular one, it says there's the rate that you would be paying would be anywhere from 11.99% to 20.99%. And of course, that's based on what your credit score is. Um, but I think that that's an important thing for people, especially when you get those 0% offers. The 0% offer is great, but it is for that limited time, and then you want to know what it's going to be jumping to. There's fees on this particular one. Um, the fees that might be on top of any interest or anything like that that you might pay. Um, what are those annual fees that you might have with that particular one? And then, of course, the one thing that I always like to point out, too, is with that credit card offer that you get, make sure that you look at things like cash advances. And <laughs> I know when that credit card comes, you get that PIN number for cash advances, and my recommendation is tear it up, throw it away, forget you ever saw it. Because as you can see on here, you've got the APR for cash advances is 23.99%, which is higher than any of the other rates that you'd be paying. And there's no grace period, there's nothing for that. When you take that cash advance out, it starts now. And it's going to continue until that balance is taken down to zero. So it's always gonna be on that portion. So it, cash advances are just bad, 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 bad. Um, when it comes to loans, um, same type of idea when you're searching for a loan, you wanna calculate how much you need and then making sure that you're looking at what your credit report is so you've got a pretty good idea of what you could um, potentially qualify for. And then of course you wanna shop for the rates that are out there and make sure that you, you ask. You know, if I borrow this, what is the rate going to be? What's, you know, what's the rate going to be for this? And then, of course, picking your best option that goes along with it. And again, keeping your options open, because there are a lot of places out there that are, are willing to do that, and you want to get the one that's going to fit you the best. And then, debt problems. If those happen, what do you do? Um, the dangers of excessive debt, again, are just so much. You have, first of all, the inability to keep up with your everyday expenses. And of course, that leads to the stress over your, those financial worries. That leads to the inability to save for your future. And then, of course, the damage to your credit history as well. So it's just, it's a horrible cycle to get into. And when you start to feel overwhelmed, um, again, I think for a lot of people, it's, that's Kind of, some people want to just rather cower in the corner as opposed to deal with it. But when you realize the things that can happen with this, it really is important to take care of it as soon as you possibly can. So this is a, a really, I think, a good video to take, that takes a look at how to go about managing that debt if you ever run into those problems. Let's take a quick look at this. For thousands of years, people have borrowed money to buy things. It's how the banking business started. Debt is not necessarily bad, but if you're not reducing debt faster than you're accumulating it, then debt can be a disaster to your financial health. Here's a question. How much is too much debt for you? Banks evaluate your credit worthiness by calculating your total debt to income ratio. 36% is acceptable. Over 40% is a red flag for potential danger. Under 30% is where you want to be. Do your own calculations to see if you are debt heavy. Here are some warning signs of carrying too much debt. You spend more than you earn each month. You skip payments on some bills in order to pay others. You make the minimum payments on your credit cards. You're maxed out on your credit card limits. 
you're receiving late payment notices. If you think you have too much debt, you probably do. Let's talk about a plan to better manage and minimize your debts. First, create a realistic budget and follow it. Only 39% of Americans set a monthly budget and stick to it. That's probably why the majority of Americans spent more than they earned last year. Have a debt reduction plan. It's smart to pay down the debts with the highest interest rates. Some people prefer to pay off their smallest debts first. Do whatever works for you, as long as you're constantly reducing what you owe. Adjust your lifestyle. Sometimes the single best strategy is to live more simply. Drive a less expensive car. Sell your house and get a smaller mortgage. Find ways to cut back, spend less, and save more. Earn more money. Look into your options for a higher paying job or get a second part-time job to increase your monthly income. Start saving. Make saving part of your monthly budget. It takes commitment and discipline, but most money smart people save at least 15% of their income every month. Talk directly with your creditors. Many will work out a revised payment schedule. If they know you're committed to paying off your obligation, they sometimes reduce their fees or won't report you to a credit bureau. Debt is not the problem. Being responsible about it is. Minimizing your debt and managing your cash flow is crucial to your financial health. You can't get ahead if you're falling behind, and you want to get ahead. I really wish I was a good artist because those shows, those little clips like that just blow me away. I think that's awesome. You know, as, I was, as I'm watching this, I, I just keep thinking, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy because when you look at credit, we talk about, about getting it. We talk about the, you know, how convenient it can be, all the good things that it can provide, but our conversations always come back to this and, and getting into trouble. And that's where, it, again, the whole using it responsibly really, really, I think, is, is so important. And once you understand it, I think that that helps you to do that. I also found this article, and I think this is really good, too. Just some ways to get out of debt faster. And they've got 11 suggestions here, so I want to put this up here for you to take a look at as well. Um, and again, you'll have access to this so you can read it, read it on your own, too. But some just great, helpful advice. Um, Paying more than the minimum payment. It, it just, it blows me away when, uh, when I talk to people and they look at their credit card payments and they're just simply making the minimum payment all the time. They could afford more, um, but they're making that minimum payment. And again, realizing that that minimum payment is going to leave you in that debt trap all the time. Um, the minimum payment is set up for you so that, again, they're making the maximum amount off of you that they can. Um, of course, you got to pay that minimum at least, but, but try to pay more than that. Um, the snowball method that we talked about last week a little bit too. Looking at the smallest um, debts that you have out there, paying those off first, and then attacking the next biggest one, the next biggest one, the next biggest one. Those are some great things. Number three. Um, I love this term, <laughs> and I just I think it's great. Just pick up a side hustle, figures, and I and I just, it's just been over the last year or so that I've heard them phrase it that way. You know, you always hear, get another job, find a weekend. I love that side hustle. I just think that that's a cool a cool term for that. And I if I shared this this story with you, please stop me. But one of my favorite stories um, from Dave Ramsey is actually when I was first introduced to him. And I was driving home late one night and um, turned on his radio show. Never heard of the guy before, but I'm listening to him. And this guy calls in and he says, Dave, he says, I just, I don't know what, what to do anymore. I am working, I'm working, I'm working, but I just can't seem to make a, debt, a, a dent in my debt anymore. He said, I don't know what to do. And the first thing Dave asked him, he said, tell me what you do for a living. So he told him. And he said, well, how much are you working? So I'm working 40 hours a week. I'm busting my, my butt. I'm doing everything I can. And Dave said, well, what are you doing on the weekends? 
And the guy said, well, my, my weekends are kind of my time. I've worked so hard during the week, I kind of deserve that time. And Dave said, no, you don't. He said, you got yourself in this mess, you gotta get out. What are you doing at night? Well, at night I get home from work and I spend some time with my family. I said, no, your, your job now is to get out of debt. So he was pushing this, and I, and I tell my students that all the time. If, if you are getting yourself in or you want something that bad, you've gotta be willing to do that. So find something that you can do. Find something that's gonna bring you a little bit extra. Um, the fourth one, creating and living with that bare bones budget. Um, they said 39% of Americans live by a budget. That's not a very good percentage. We know over 75% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. So you've got to figure out how you're going to do this and how you're going to make it work. Where is your money going? How can you make some of that money go to, to tackle that debt for you? Number five, sell everything you don't need. And that's some pretty good advice too. If you've got things lying around that you're not using, if there's somebody out there that can, can use it, go ahead and see what you can do. Um, the seasonal part-time job, that's something that can help too. Christmas time, you know, lots of people will look at taking up some, some uh, retail hours and things like that, so that's another good one. Um, number seven, ask for lower interest rates on your credit cards. Negotiate other bills. Bottom line is most lenders really truly just want what? They want their money back, right? They want their money back. So they might be willing to give you a break on the interest. They might be willing to, to excuse some of the fees or the, the penalties that are out there if you can get them paid back. Do uh, renegotiating an interest rate, does that affect your credit negatively? Depends on how you do it. Okay. If you're using um, like a debt consolidation or debt a company like that, yeah. sometimes it can be actually looked at as a, like a chapter seven bankruptcy, mm -hmm. chapter seven. I'm, I'm, it's leaving me right now, but, yeah. but, it, but if they do a certain thing, if they actually will, if they go out there and this company negotiates on your behalf, mm -hmm. that sometimes can be reported to the credit bureau. And if that's reported, some creditors, some lenders will look at that as a bankruptcy. But me picking up the phone and calling my credit card. That's not gonna have an impact, no, no. But that's, again, something that, I, I shouldn't say it that way. I should say those are things that you always wanna ask. And that's, again, when I talk about consolidation companies, I say the same thing. Talk to them and just ask them, say, all right, I'm interested in your service, but how is this going to affect my credit? Is this gonna have a negative impact? And if it does, then you might wanna look to talk to somebody else. But usually, if you're gonna talk on your behalf, that's not gonna have an impact. Um, the balance transfers, you know, again, we've talked about that. There are credit card offers out there all the time. And if you're not a person that's doing this consistently, Maybe that's something that's gonna give you a little bit of relief. It'll take away that interest for that, that year or whatever. Um, but of course, <laughs> if you're gonna do that, you don't wanna be charging up anymore on that credit card. You're transferring it to this card for a specific reason, and that, and that is to get the, the interest to stop for a period of time. So you don't wanna start making charges on that card as well. Um, number nine, use found money to pay off balances. You're, you know, again, when people get their tax refunds, the tax refund, they say, oh, this is my play money. This is, well, no, use it for this. Um, they get a bonus from work. Oh, I'm gonna go on vacation. No, let's use it to, to, take, to tackle our debt a little bit. Number 10 is dropping some expensive habits that you might have. Um, and number 11, the last one, step away from whatever it is that's getting you in trouble. If it's, the credit card that's getting you in trouble, if it's you know, making online purchases that's getting you in trouble, if it's certain stores that are getting you in trouble, again, you've gotta practice that self-discipline and you have to walk away. All right, and I just love the bottom line here. It's easy to continue living in debt if you never have to face the reality of your situation. But when disaster strikes, you can gain a brand new outlook in a hurry. It's also easy to get sick of the paycheck to paycheck lifestyle and look for ways to get out from under the crushing weight of too many monthly payments. So that's a great statement to live by. And then here's another one about debt relief. And I'll, I'll let you look at this one on, on your own. Um, this one actually goes into a little bit more of the questions about consolidation, things like that. So there's actually a little survey that you can do in here to see if consolidation is a good idea for you. Um, but you can take a look at, at that one. 
All right. Th any questions? I feel like I kind of blew through this, but mm -hmm. I want to make sure. On the, the very last page of this, and again, when you get a copy of it, I've got some more resources for you. A couple of these. Um, this first one, How to Get Out of Debt and Be Financially Successful, this is from one of Dave's um, shows. It's about, a, I think it's between 20 minutes and a half an hour, but it, it's outstanding. Some just great stuff. And again, if you've never experienced Dave Ramsey, I think it's, it's fun just to take a look at him. Um, and then, of course, the snowball versus the avalanche method. The avalanche is where you get the highest interest rate one and you tackle that first. We talked about that in the last session. Um, I put that one back under here because I, I think that it fits as well, along with Dave, Dave's baby steps. But then there's two other um, videos I put in here, too. Um, just some different ways that you can improve your credit score and then ways that you can manage credit, too. So there's a couple other videos that you can watch when you get a chance. They're just really, really good ones, too.